Welcome to Canada's podcast, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. Hello, this is Robert Smigel coming to you today with Vancouver's podcast, a member of the Canada's podcast network, where we talk to the entrepreneurs who are making it happen here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mike Desjardins is an entrepreneur, husband, dad, crossfitter, skier, yogi, and longtime meditator. His business, Virtus, has been on an 18-year journey focused on making a difference in the lives of others through leadership, development, and strategic planning. His clients are $100 million plus medium to large enterprise organizations spread across Canada. Virtus was proud to become certified as a B Corp this past week. Well, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time today to be here for all our listeners. I appreciate your time, Robert. Great. Okay. I want you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and give us the details on your current business. Sure. Uh, I think, I mean, the intro covered a lot of it. Um, you know, I live in Vancouver. Uh, I've had this business for 18 years now. Um, since 2002, I've been a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, and I've been in the same forum group for the past uh, coming on 15 years with uh, the same group of CEOs, and we meet monthly. So that's a big part of my life. Um, the business itself, Furtis, we do leadership development for, as you mentioned, $100 million and larger clients. Um, uh, most of our clients are actually quite a bit larger than that, but that's kind of the entry point to working with us. And that's about 90% of our revenue comes from leadership development and 10% of it comes from strategic planning. Uh, all the leadership development is customized, so I don't have anything to sell anybody. It's, it's, uh, we very much start with a needs analysis. And from there, we try to determine what the best approach would be to develop the leaders all the way from CEOs and executives, directors, uh, managers, team leads, uh, all the way through to high potential uh, in an organization. Okay, let's go back to 18 years ago. Did you need sure. financing to start your company? And how do you currently make money in your business now? It's a great question. Um, well, the financing actually came from, there were four of us that started the company. And we each put in $25,000. This was in uh, October of 2000. And uh, that was our seed capital. Uh, that and then not paying ourselves for a year and a half, that also helped uh, with cash flow. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, racking up lines of credit and all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was really where the business started. And, uh, and then from there, we, you know, we, I bought up my business partners a uh, number of years ago, a couple of them back in uh, 2003 and the last one in 2008 and uh, paid off all that bank debt a long time ago. And um, yeah, so it's, since then, it's just been self-financed as a business um, all the way through to today. And I'm sorry, what was the other question that you asked? Uh, about how do you business? currently make money? Uh, is yeah, it's a great question. So we, we work with uh, large organizations who are looking to develop their leaders across their business. And they usually have in mind some type of outcome or we'll help them figure out what that outcome looks like. And they uh, will build up a plan. Um, you know, in, in some cases, that plan might take five or six years uh, to actually roll out and uh, completely across the whole organization. Of course, new people are joining the organization. People are retiring. People are quitting. People are getting fired. So there's always turnover in the leadership ranks. And we're constantly uh, looking at how we think about developing the leaders in the organization. So those organizations pay us uh, to be in there uh, developing their leaders. Okay, what is the long-term vision and what will your company look like in the future? Do you see the company expanding into other areas and where beyond Vancouver, BC or even Canada? It's a great question. Um, I've always seen Virtus as an ongoing experiment. So from the very beginning, uh, I didn't come at this from a consulting perspective. I came at it from being a business executive and I looked at this business and thought, well, I don't know how to do consulting. So I'm going to look at how everybody else does it. And then I'm going to sort of chart my own path and figure out what I think is the right way to do it. And it really got focused less on the approach that's traditional in our marketplace, which is, you know, bill a whole bunch of hours and then charge people per hour. So you have an incentive to take a lot longer to do the work because you're getting paid by the hour. Um, I looked at that and said, that doesn't seem right to me. 
I don't think that's in the best interest of our clients. It doesn't really feel like a partnership. So I found an approach which was all about value, which said, instead, let's find out what this is going to cost to do. Peg a number for the whole year for the client, set that number in stone, and then go about achieving the goals they want to achieve and making sure they're getting the value that they want. And if things have to change throughout the engagement, we realize that it's harder than we thought or there's more work that needs to be involved. There's no change in the price of the client. So that means it's really a a, a true partnership in terms of the approach. In terms of this ongoing experiment and where it's going for the future, I've got a really talented, incredibly smart group of people that run this business for me day to day. And we meet every year. We go away for a week. Um, We've been to to Scottsdale a couple of years. We've done uh, Phoenix. We've done um, uh, Palm Springs, uh, Mexico two years. Uh, this year, we've rented uh, this amazing house on Vancouver Island on the water. And we basically spent a week together to decide where we want to go over the next year and then what that looks like for Virtus over the next three to five years. Our focus right now is on ensuring that we are um, developing the very best strategies for helping leaders change their behaviors. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. If we can help somebody um, change the behaviors that aren't working for them to behaviors that are more productive for them, they're going to be a different person. And if we get a chance to do that with all the leaders in the organization, changing all the behaviors of all the leaders, that's a cultural revolution for that organization. So our focus, as you mentioned earlier, around um, wanting to make a difference in the lives of others is to continue to do that and to continue to expand. Right now, we work across Canada and um, we're in the process of working on some alliances and partnerships, which will help to expand that uh, reach into the United States. And also, we're looking at different lines of work that are adjacent to the work that we do, Uh, in particular, work helping to do very large scale conflict resolution and helping organizations that are in a stuck point where they just can't get their their belief of how the world works is actually holding them back from breaking out ahead of their industry and helping them rethink how they think about the work that they do day to day. So that's kind of the things that are exciting to me. We're looking at virtual reality right now. We've always had a passion for technology, but only in that it's something that will help leaders grow faster um, or help us do the work that we're doing more efficiently. We're not really big fans on technology for technology's sake. Okay. Well, we've learned a little bit about you and uh, your company, but we want to talk about doing business in Vancouver now. Sure. What, What are the biggest benefits for you and being an entrepreneur here in Vancouver, BC? I want you to give us some of the good points about starting a company here. But I also want you to give us some of the tough things or challenges for our listeners so they can keep an eye out for them. Well, it's interesting because it is a double, it, the, the, the benefit and the, um, uh, the detriment are actually the same. And, and I learned this early on. So um, when we started this, I was in a position where I had been traveling with the previous company that I'd worked for. They put me through my business degree and um, I had been traveling all over North America for this group of companies. And I burnt out in San Diego, in La Jolla, uh, at 27 years old on a business trip. And I realized that my life was unmanageable and I needed to come up with a new plan. And that led to doing this, to doing Virtus. And when I you know, popped into this, all of a sudden I realized, oh, wait, I've been so busy building somebody else's business for them for the last uh, 10 years that I forgot to keep track of all my contacts and connections in Vancouver. And so all of a sudden I'm doing this startup and I realized that I'm in the business of really of relationships and trust. And I've not done a great job of keeping track of all the people I went to high school with, all the people I went to business school with. So I kind of had to reestablish um, the relationships and, and Vancouver is definitely a relationship city. Um, you know, in, that's one of the joys of working here actually, is that when you build up great relationships in this city, um, it, it can carry you. Uh, across, I mean, there's I, the whole thing of Kevin Bacon, the six degrees of freedom of um, connection. Like here, I think it's two or three max. So it is pretty easy to know somebody who knows the person you want to meet. And so it really is about the strength of the relationships that you develop. The challenge, of course, is if you're new to Vancouver, and I've had a competitor that moved here from Calgary, and uh, he, you know, he reached out when he when moved, was going to move his firm here and. And said so he's coming to the market and he's going to be competing with us. He wanted to say hi. And so we went out for lunch and, and uh, 
uh, a year later, he took me out for lunch again and he said, uh, yeah, I'm, I think we're going to pull out of Vancouver. And I'm like, oh my God, like what happened? And he said, I'm tired of hearing about Virtus and I'm tired of hearing about your name. Um, we've realized that this is a city based on relationships and you have them. And I said to him, well, yeah, I mean, it is, but you just have to put your time in to build the relationships up. He said, well, how long did that take you? And I said, oh, probably the first five years of the business where we was a real struggle to grow this business without having a really solid relationship base around town. And he said, I'm not willing to invest that time. I'm like, okay, well, that's totally fair. <laughs> but that's that my experience is what it's going to take. So after a year of being here, he decided to, to, uh, to focus his business back in Alberta. Okay, we do some of our best work outside the office. Is there a place in the lower mainland close to where you live or work where you like to go recharge or get inspired with ideas or just think about your business? And does it change with the season considering all the rain we get here? <laughs> I love the rain, actually. So <laughs> I think I'm the anomaly uh, from that perspective. I mean, rain in Vancouver is, you know, it's kind of the, it just is what it is. We live in a rainforest. People, when they travel here, they say, oh my God, it's, it's so clean. It's so green. It's like, yeah, because it rains all the time. <laughs> That's why it's so clean and green. So, um, but for me, when I see that it's raining in Vancouver, I know that it's snowing in Whistler. And um, we have a, another home in Whistler. And we spend a tremendous amount of time there where they're, you know, the whole Christmas break, where they're spring break, where every weekend during the ski season. And halfway between Vancouver and Whistler, there's a, there's a little city called, a little town called Squamish. And when we're on the road, Friday afternoon, we pick up our daughter and we're driving to Whistler. And, we're, and by the time we hit Squamish, my brain is kind of disconnected from Vancouver. And I get into this mode where I feel like I'm on vacation every single weekend. Uh, that were up there. And it turns out that I have a ton of clients that ski and are, are at Whistler and are there every weekend. And, and so I get a chance to connect with them, but it's just a different vibe. Like if I ran into them in the city in Vancouver. Um, I might say hi to them at a coffee shop, but I'm not going to spend seven hours skiing like the, the way I would in Whistler, seven hours skiing with them and hanging out and going for dinner. And it just feels different. And so I find that, um, but really Whistler and airplanes, I don't know why airplanes, but airplanes have always been those and Whistler have been the two places where I feel like I get my most um, uh, creative energy, my best white space, the places where the ideas really start to coalesce. Um, meditation has always helped me with that for the last 10 years. Um, but for some reason, set and setting uh, seems to help even more. Okay, we have a lot of international listeners. So this next question, I want you to speak to them. If you were to start all over again, and you just moved here to Vancouver, BC, but this time you don't know anyone, knowing what you know now, what would you do? And how would you go about starting all over again as an entrepreneur? Well, this took me a long time to figure out, but it was actually thanks to Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I read his book, um, The Tipping Point, and in it, he talked about um, three different types of people that are important to connect with when you're trying to grow a business. Uh, one was called a salesperson, one was called a maven, and the other was called a connector. And what I read about these connectors, it turns out that these are people that know a lot of people, but they don't know a lot of people at a shallow level. They know a lot of people at a deep level. People trust them. Um, they're well connected in the city, and um, there's they're they're a bit hard to find. But if you start asking around. And you ask, like, who's a really well-connected person, which is what I did. All of a sudden, I realized in my age category, there was probably about 10 or 15 people that were really well-connected. So I reached out to them and I introduced myself or I got friends to introduce me, got to know them. They're wonderful people, right? Of course, because everybody likes them. They're well-connected. And um, so I got to know them. Really easy to become friends with them because they're such lovely people. And... Uh, all of a sudden, I, I said to them, you know, well, what can I do to help you? I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to grow this business, but who are the types of clients you're looking for? And so I made it a point of trying to figure out how I could help these connectors before I asked for anything from them. And what I learned really quickly is that if you do things for connectors, you don't have to ask for anything in return. They're, they just want to help because that's how they're wired. And so for me, it was my goal of trying to become better connected was to was um, satisfied through meeting and, and um, becoming friends with all these connectors. And then as a result, I became one too. And one day I realized that 
wow, there was, there was a good 10 or 11 people that I was meeting for coffee or lunch with every single month to talk about business and to make introductions for them, open doors. And they were doing the same for me. And it dawned on me, they didn't know each other at all. They didn't even met. And so I reached out to all of them and I said, hey, you guys don't know each other, but I meet with all of you once a month. Would you be open to getting together once a month as a group? And every single person said yes. And so that was the start of in 2009 of something that I regretfully called the Happy Dance Club. Regretfully, because I think it's a little silly now. But uh, so I started the Happy Dance Club and I, and I invited these 11 um, CEOs to come together and basically meet and help each other grow each other's businesses. And I thought of it as, as an experiment, like I'll do this for six months and, you know, if it works great. And if it doesn't, no harm, no foul. I'll have introduced some amazing people, which I have a deep amount of respect for. And that'll be it. Well, fast forward 10 years, and there's been changeover in some of the members of the group, but that group has still been meeting uh, every month for the past 10 years. And all of our business has grown substantially. Um, a number of our key clients have come from introductions from members of that group. And I'm just so happy to call every single person in that group a, a close friend. What does the first hour look like for you when you get up in the morning? And do you have a specific routine or a ritual that helps you get motivated to start your day? I do. I do. It's a great question. I wake up at 630 and my alarm goes off. Um, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm at CrossFit. Mondays and Fridays, I go to uh, the gym in our building and I run and I do core exercises. And Wednesdays, I stretch. So Saturdays and Sundays, I ski. So that's kind of my, that's my week in a nutshell, how I start my day. Once I've done my exercise when I'm in Vancouver, um, I, the first thing I do when I hit my desk is I open my journal and I do some morning pages. Um, it's kind of a combination of the Freedom Journal, the Five Minute Journal, Tim Ferriss's Morning Rituals. Um, I've kind of built my own sort of journaling um, practice that I do every morning. And it takes about five, seven minutes for me to kind of dump my thoughts out. So that's how I start. Um, if I haven't got a stack day of meetings, then I'll usually meditate right after I've done the journaling. And if I, if I don't have time to meditate in the morning, and I'll, I'll choose to do it uh, either later in the day or before I go to bed at night. But that's my morning routine. Do you think entrepreneurs have to be weird or unique in a positive way or are wired differently? <laughs> my wife, <laughs> I wish my wife could answer this question for you. <laughs> when we first met, which was uh, coming on, uh, let's see, it was 11 years ago. Um, uh, she said to me, I, I've met a lot of the people that you know. Some of them, they're weird. They're wired differently. Some of them are socially awkward, but somehow they're crazy successful. <laughs> and I said to her, you know what? I'm like, they're very good at one thing. And they've, they've more than doubled down on that one thing. And even if other areas of their life maybe don't function in a way that they would like them to, they have this incredible skill set that, that is um, something that they have worked really hard at. And they have an incredible amount of persistence and resilience that goes along with that. And they don't take no for an answer ever. Um, so I think that, yeah, that, that entrepreneurs are wired differently. I would never um, stop anyone from going down the path of entrepreneurship because I think that it's a way of, you know, testing your belief in yourself because fundamentally entrepreneurship tests our belief. It tests my belief in myself on an ongoing basis because if I don't have the confidence the persistence and the resilience to either chart the path or figure out how to get out of a challenge or decide what we're going to do next. I, nobody else is going to, that's my job. That's my role. And it has been that way from the very beginning. What books are you reading now and why are even audiobooks? And can you recommend any books for listeners who are also aspiring entrepreneurs? So I think the, the book that I, um, that, well, the, what I'm reading right now, so I'm reading Cracking the CrossFit Open. Um, the CrossFit Open starts on February 21st. I'm still deciding if I want to do it again this year, but I'm reading that book. I'm reading a book called The Coaching Habit, which is by Michael Bungay uh, Stange. Um, I'm reading another book um, by, somebody on my team, by somebody who works uh, on my team, uh, Tana Hemmonsley, and her book is called Awaken Your Authentic Leadership. 
and uh, and I'm listening to an audio book right now by um, Yuval. Uh, I think his last name is Jawar. Harari, yeah, Yuval Harari, called um, the 21st century, and um, it's kind of an eclectic um, mix of books. Uh, I think if I was starting all over again, oh, you know what? I'm trying to remember the name of it. The gentleman who was the the head of Apple marketing around the Macintosh, not Scully, but before him, um, there's a gentleman who was the uh, head of marketing at Apple. And he's got an amazing startup book. You know what I'll do? I'll find it and you can, maybe we can throw it in the show, the show notes. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Any online or offline tools you use on a daily basis? Online or offline tools that I use on a daily basis. Um, I think, I mean, the one that I'm, I just love is the um, Muse 2 brain sensing headset for meditation. So I bought the original Muse about a year ago and I loved it. And then when Muse introduced the Muse 2 more recently, um, that measures um, your pulse as well and your breathing, uh, I bought that one and I really like it. I, I mean, been, as I mentioned, I've been a long time meditator. I've used the um, Headspace app. Before that, I used the meditation podcast. Um, but since I've got the Muse, I found that what it's done is it's really helped me to train my brain to be able to focus more. I've got undiagnosed, but my wife is diagnosed, um, uh, ADHD. And I think that's a relatively common thing in entrepreneurs. And uh, calming down that monkey mind is something that I've found incredibly helpful in staying present, both with my family, with my clients, with the people I work with, um, with my friends. And the Muse um, brain sensing uh, headset has helped me out tremendously. I, I don't leave the house without Apple AirPods uh, in my ears because I'm constantly listening to uh, blogs um, or uh, sorry podcasts um, uh, as I'm walking around Vancouver or I'm listening to an audiobook. So those pretty much go everywhere with me. Um, I've just been working on my 2019 goals. I'm a little bit slow this year. I've been kind of struggling. Everything's going amazingly well right now, and I'm struggling to think about what really matters to me. Um, and so I'm re re looking at my, my all time favorite book, which is, um, by Greg McCallan called essentialism. And it really, his whole principle is about, um, if you, that we say a lukewarm yes to things in life that we really should say no to. And so our choices really need to be either hell yes or no. And I'm rethinking about 2019 in the context of that. So, um, there's a tool that I use a website called lifetick.com. And what LifeTick does is it's basically a goal tracker. I've used it for about seven years now. And um, it's out of Australia. It's a really simple tool. It's like 20 bucks a year. And it really helps me to keep track of my personal goals and my business and family goals. Um, it's a great habit tracker as well. And there's a habit tracking piece to it in terms of how it's set up. So that's something I, I would visit you know, every week. But the AirPods and the Muse are something I use every day. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you like to do for a profession? Ah, that's a that's a really good question. <laughs> I actually don't know. I love what I do. Like I'm just like beyond passionate about what I do. I can think of I, professional, yeah, I honestly, professional skier. Professional skier. I know I skiing is one of those. No, because you know, you know, sometimes when you take your hobby and you turn it into a profession, the joy goes away and skiing is something that's really social for me. And so I do it because I love it. CrossFit, you know, CrossFit, you can take it to the regionals. You can make it a sport and I don't do it for that. I do it to stay healthy. I've got a six and a half year old daughter. I'm 46 years old. I want to be, you know, um, rock climbing with her and, uh, and going heli skiing and, doing any sort of running a marathon if she wants to run. I want to do that stuff with her as long as she wants to hang out and do stuff with me like that. I'm going to, I want to be physically fit for her. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really, there's nothing else that I would rather be doing. If, if there was anything, it would be in the technology space. I love technology. I follow a ton of technology blogs. I buy every cool little gadget that comes out. Um, you know, I bought a, I bought a Tesla recently just because I just couldn't fathom getting anything other than a Tesla just because of the technology that's in it. I'm like, it's, 
like driving the future. And I just had to have it. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'd do something probably in the technology space, but what, I don't know. No idea. What kind of a job would you not like to do? Couldn't do it. Anything that had a lot of detail to it. It is not my strong suit. I have very smart, talented people around me that have a high level of detail acuity and I'm grateful for them. Um, I, I, anything that would involve a, a ton of detail would just not be the right thing for me. In business, what is your favorite word, quote, or sentence that you like to use? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. I have a lot. Um, Can you give me one? favorite quote. Yeah. Well, it's from, um, there's one that, uh, that I used at um, one of the facilitators at Virtus is famous for saying, and I just love it. It's about change. And he said, um, you know, people don't mind change. They just don't want to be changed. And that's Jeffrey Kearney who said that. Very smart man. And uh, I just love that because it's true, right? We don't mind when we're the authors, authors of change. But in an organization, if we're not the author of the change, sometimes we can feel like the victim of the change. And that doesn't feel great. What's your least favorite word or sentence you do not like to hear? Least favorite? Well, oh, um, that's impossible, or I can't, or that's our policy. <laughs> Those three things. I'm like, just watch me. <laughs> if you had Thanks for throwing out the challenge. <laughs> I'm ignoring what you say because all three of those things are ridiculous. So just watch me. Okay. If you had to pick one or two words to describe yourself, what would it be and why? Curious? Energetic? Uh, intuitive? I always think about how my wife, Sabrina, would describe me. She would probably say, uh, she always says that I have two modes, on and off. It's like either going 100 miles an hour or at a dead stop. So I'd say probably energetic is there. Okay. Um, if I were to ask my close friends, they'd probably say thoughtful. What keeps you up at night, if anything? I love the strategic side of the work that I do. And I'm super curious about the future of leadership development, the future of learning for adults and how machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to shift the way that the world works, but also the way that we view how we interface with the world. And I think what keeps me up is trying to stay ahead of all of that. Not, I mean, staying ahead of all that is probably not the right way of describing it, but staying abreast, I guess, of what's happening out there in the world, not just in our space, but I've got this deep curiosity for how the whole world works. Every industry, every space, everything. I'm deeply curious to know how all of it works. I'm constantly researching things. I'm going down these rabbit holes. And I think that's what keeps me up is knowing is, am I doing the right things? Am I guiding the company in the right direction? Am I doing the right research? Am I talking to the right people to get a fulsome appreciation of where the world is going and how that affects the work we do and the way we partner with our clients? Okay, I want you to give us the top three things on your inspired life list. This could be whether you want to travel more, TEDx talk, write books, philanthropy, anything like that? Yeah, so um, real estate. So one of my things I've always been interested in is um, as a side little project to Virtus is to start investing in income producing real estate. So that's important to me. Um, outside of that, uh, I used to have, you know, I wanted to write a book at one point. I wanted to do a podcast at one point. And then I started getting written about in books and I started getting asked like this podcast, for instance, to be interviewed. And I thought, Oh, that's a lot less work. <laughs> if you're the person being interviewed or if you're the person that, um, the book that is being quoted or a story about me has gone into a book. And that, I actually like that more now that I see it. Um, I enjoy that. So no, I, I, my joy is coming from continuing to build this business. I have a lot of amazing people that I work with and I love the fact that the bigger that we get, the more opportunity it provides for them, um, for their career growth, um, for, for them financially. Um, I love that. You know, I love that we get to work with an eclectic, um, group of clients and industries and, 
And as we get larger, we work with larger and larger clients. And so because everything we do is custom, you know, nobody brings me the easy problems, right? If it was easy, they could do it themselves. We get the tough stuff. And I love that because everything is new all the time. And each organization has its own idiosyncrasies and we got to figure out what is the right thing for them. And I love that. Like I, I love the fact that I get to do this and this is my job. It's, I just feel so lucky that I've landed on a career where my per- personal purpose of making a difference in the lives of others is exactly the purpose of my business. Like I feel so lucky that I get to do this. Do you have any advice that you may have received that you can pass on to entrepreneurs or British Columbia? Any advice that I re- I do, and I'm just going to say that the book I was referencing before is by Guy Kawasaki, and it's called The Art of the Start. And I wish I would have read that before I started my business because I cried through some of those chapters thinking about the mistakes that I've made that Guy Kawasaki seemed to know the answers to up front. So I wish I would have read that book first. Um, advice for entrepreneurs um, starting a business. Your friends and family are not going to get it. Some of them will, some of them won't. Well past the point of their comfort zone for your adventure, they would give up and you keep going. That's probably the thing that surprised me the most was that when it wasn't working or I was still trying to figure it out and, and that people close to me would say, you know, maybe, maybe you should do something different. Maybe you should go back and get another job and shut the business down. And I'm like, no, I just, I'm close. I just, I got to keep going. If I keep going, I know I can figure it out. And, and I look back at it and I think if I'd listened, I wouldn't have what I have today. And what I have today is amazing. And so I think that if you're starting a business, um, you need a small group of people who believe in you. And a whole bunch of people are not going to believe in your vision and not believe in your dream. And it's because it scares them to consider doing it. They don't think that it's possible. And that's cool. They can stay where they are, but you go and do what you want to do. Okay, Mike, are you ready to have some fun? Yeah, absolutely. I'm already having fun. (laughs) Okay. We're going to have a little bit more fun. As you know, entrepreneurs are always connected. Uh, We're always online. Um, Yep. We're very, very busy people, but we're going to take you away from all that. There's a small tropical island just off of Fiji yeah. that only has yeah. one phone booth there. There is no internet. Yeah. This place does exist. We're going to drop you off there. You won't have a computer or a smartphone or a tablet. You can use the phone booth located there on the island to call the boat. We'll come pick you up. How long would you last before you made that call? And what would you do while you were there? I mean, I would last about 20 seconds. Um, I would pick up the phone and I would call and the boat and I would tell them my wife and daughter need to get on a plane. This Island is amazing. (laughs) Get them on the boat and bring them here and we'll stay here for a month. And the three of us will figure it out. And then in a month, come back and get us. So your daughter can handle no internet, your wife, no internet, you no internet. Without issue. I honestly, you know, I feel like, I feel like there's this addiction to, I mean, I know there's an addiction to the the technology and my wife and I talk about all the time, having a young daughter who's in grade one and I bought her, you know, we bought her an iPad when she was two years old and we said, you know, we want her to learn how to use this device, but we also want to learn how to, for her to learn how to respect it and understand that, that, that it can be too much of a good thing. And by not restricting it, she has really healthy boundaries around that. She puts it away and she's like, I'd rather color. I'd rather play with my dolls. Instead of craving it, which I see sometimes kids are craving it. I mean, that just be, that might just be her personality. Um, and I'm not suggesting that this is for everyone, but for Lily, she has um, really developed a really um, healthy way around technology. And so, you know, I think we would do fine. Like we have so much fun, the three of us. Um, when we go to Hawaii, we have an annual 10 day trip that we do in the fall. And um, my phone goes in the safe. And so does Sabrina's. And we just head out for the day and we don't check them. We don't post, you know, we'll eventually every couple of days we'll, we'll go and post it. But I put an out of office uh, on whenever I go on vacation and that's 13 weeks a year. And I don't check my email. I just, well, it'll deal with it when I get back. My phone's turned off and it goes to voicemail and it says, 
if you need something, here's all the people you can talk to. I don't know, Robert, if you received my out of office over the holidays when we were chatting, yeah, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's explicit instructions. Here's all the, I got this from Tim Ferriss. You know, it, he said like, oh, just leave instructions about who to talk to. And um, so I put all of that out there. And then um, my clients have been incredibly respectful. Um, they're busy people as well. And they respect vacation. They want to have a real vacation too. And so I just shut it down. So being on an island with no technology for a month, I mean, I've, again, I have an incredibly smart group of people who run my company. Um, they can handle anything. Um, the biggest challenges that we've had as a business, they've just soared right through it. So, um, and then on a personal perspective, I'll see my friends in a month. be fine. Okay, great. We're going to wrap things up here. How can our listeners get hold of you? Is there anything you'd like to add before you leave us today? I really appreciate you making time to um, have a chat. Uh, it's been quite a journey. I thought it was going to be one of these straight line type things and it hasn't been, it's been all over the map. Um, the highs and the lows and the, the you know, the, the decisions to make along the way. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've it's, it's created a really amazing life for myself and for my family. Uh, again, I feel really lucky and really blessed that um, I have what I have. Um, today and I get to work with these amazing people that I get to work with. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's the only thing I wanted to add. And then, um, how to reach me, um, our website is vertisync.com. Um, B is in Victor, I is in Indigo, Romeo, Tango, Uniform, Sierra, Indigo, November, Charlie.com. And, uh, there's lots about us, uh, on there. And, uh, yeah, if there's anyone out there in the world and you're struggling with how you're going to try to develop your leaders and, you're growing your business and you realize you actually can't achieve your strategy unless you're able to develop your leaders faster. Give us a call. If we can help, um, we'll certainly help. And if it's not us that can help, we usually know who the right people to talk to are. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I've learned a lot about you and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.